anyway. So yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Laura, for uh, for organizing this. Thanks, thanks everybody for being here. I'm happy to to see you all. And uh, yes, so my name is Luis Serrano. I work at Audacity. I'm the opening band for Janet Interian, who was a professor at the uh, University of San Francisco. Who will, uh, so I'll be the introduction to matrix factorization, and then she will give us a a, uh, a lab that you can follow. Um, and in, at any moment, I'd love to be stopped with questions or comments or anything. This is very, very interactive. I'll have a lot of questions for you. So first, uh, public service announcement. Uh, it's, it's Jesse, one of our organizers' birthday. He's at the very back. So everybody say happy birthday, Jesse. Cool. So we're going to talk about matrix uh, factorization and movie recommendations. So hopefully this screen looks uh, familiar for you. It's Netflix. Um, and this is actually my page of Netflix, so a lot of things that get recommended to me. Uh, TV shows, comedies, not narcos, but of course. Um, and uh, yeah, so I have a question for you. How do you think this works? Or how do you actually recommend, if it, this is you, not machine learning, how do you recommend movies to friends? Like, how do you think, oh, this person may like a movie? Any ideas? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody similar to you likes a movie, then maybe you will like a movie, right? Yes. Yourself? I was going to say, sometimes I, I don't really care what they personally like. I'll tell them either way, but I definitely recommend this movie. Even though it's not something you normally watch, you might appreciate it. And okay. It Serendipity, right? Like you want to also do like recommendations of, of uh, things that, that may be a risk, but if you like it, you're going to love it, right? So yeah, that's something else they try. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Hey, you're getting ahead. Yeah. yeah. So users, you know, you have similar users based on your. You know, uh huh. Algorithm. Yes. Like this item, this item, there are similar items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're spoiling the entire thing. Yeah, yes. Good job. Good job. Yes. What he said. Um. Yes. Yes. Um. Cool. So yeah, today I'm going to show you basically uh, uh, a method. There are many methods to, to recommend movies. And at the end of the day, all these algorithms, YouTube, Netflix, are just a combination of a million things. But I'm going to show you one that, uh, that basically predicts uh, ratings. So this is the Netflix universe. And uh, in, in our small universe, we're going to have four people. So Anna, Betty, Carlos, and Dana. OK, that's the entire human population for the next hour. And we're going to have five movies, movie one, movie two, movie three, movie four, and movie five. And we're going to have to figure out how to recommend those five movies to those four people. And we're going to go like this. What we're going to do is we're going to predict the rating that people give to a certain movie. So for example, Anna gave four stars to movie five. So we're going to store that in a table or a matrix uh, like this. Anna and movie five is going to be a four. So we're going to fill in this table like this. OK. And now I'm going to have a quiz for you. And uh, if uh, Janet maybe can help me pass around some, some sheets in case the numbers are too far away. But basically, I'm going to give you three tables. And you're going to help me guess which one is the one that behaves the most like actual humans. Table number one on the left, number two, or number three. So what do you guys think? Who thinks we behave like table number one, number two, or number three? I'll let you look at the numbers and analyze the tables and, and see what, uh, what the deal is. I hope there's a, a page for everybody, but if not, like work with your neighbor or something. And one of them's in color. See who the lucky person is. So first simple question, who thinks we behave like the first table? The first table says everybody gave every movie a three. So that's a little too predictable. And as humans, we have free will, so we're not as predictable. So it's actually not the first one. Okay? The first one just assumes that every person is the same, and also that every movie is the same. So there's a little more 
more uh, entropy in the world. So let's uh, let's see what else. What about the third one? Who thinks we're like the third one? Two people, three people, cool. Four or five. Who thinks we're like the second one? A bunch of people. Okay. So like the third one, we're also not. The third one is a little too random. It's actually random numbers I generated. Uh, and the reason is we're not also not that unpredictable. We behave in, in very predictable ways, and that's what machine learning takes into account. And that's why Netflix can recommend us movies, because we are very predictable. We may be like a friend of ours or like a combination of people. So, so it's, not, it's not the, it's, the answer is the one in the middle. Can anybody tell me uh, any, any uh, dependencies you find in the, in the table in the middle? There's a lot of dependencies, for example. Yes. Oh, that's a good call. Low variance. So, what is the what, what do you uh, how do you find the low variance? That's a good one. Yeah. For example, the the, the last person is pretty a, a beat. Uh, the others are kind of like more like you know critical. Um, that's one. Anybody else find another? Yes. First and third are the exact same thing, right? Maybe they're very similar people, right? Any others? Yes. Data likes just about everything. The data what? Likes just about everything. You know, it's four, five, four, four, three. One person a lot likes just about Dana likes a lot of stuff. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are great, great dependencies. Let me show you some more. So the first one that you spotted very well is that the first uh, two, the, uh, the first and the third row are the same, um, because it just seems like uh, Anna and Carlos just have the exact same preferences. So for Netflix purposes, they are the same person. Might as well be treated as the same person. So whatever Anna watches, we can recommend to Carlos and vice versa. Uh, there's another one. Take a look at these two columns. So they're the exact same thing. Why could that be? Well, it basically says that for Netflix purposes, M, uh, movie one is equal to movie four. And why could that be? Well, maybe it could be that movie one is a mall cop, and movie four is that movie with Seth Rogen about a cop in a mall. So, you know, maybe the people rate them very similarly. So, you know, it could be that they're not exactly the same, but they may get like very similar ratings. So we can treat them as the same thing. Uh, more, more, uh, equate, more, more uh, relations. Take a look at this three. What do these three have? Sorry. Extreme. Ah, uh, could be that. But take a look at the two top ones and the third one, and then the bottom one. Sorry. Um. Ah, uh, close to opposite. I uh, actually almost opposite tastes. There's, there's actually a, they, they add. Like the first two add to the third one, right? Like one plus three is four, two plus one is three, four plus one is five. This is purely fiction. Uh, it's not you know, super real life. But if you think about it, what, why could this be? Hmm? Yeah, could be that, right? Uh, we're really saying that one person plus the other person is equal to the third person. Um, it's really just preference-wise, right? It could be that maybe uh, Betty likes action movies and Carlos likes comedy. And Dana just loves action and comedy movies, and when it's action and comedy, he likes even more. So it, it kind of works like that, right? Like maybe one of your friends, like, I don't know, Pizza and the other one likes movies, and you do a movie night with Pizza, and then somebody just lo loves both and likes it even more. So it, it could be the case that people's preferences add, right? Or have other, other equations, subtract, etc. cetera. Um, what about these ones, these three rows? What happens there? Similar, right? The one is there. The average. the average, thank you, yes. Good call. The third one is the average of the first two. Why, why could that happen? Like in real life, why would a movie have average ratings from other two? Yeah, it's generally, right? It could be that movie two is Twister, and movie three is Jaws, and movie five is Sharknado, <laughs> right? So if you loved Tornadoes and, 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 and sharks, you like you like Sharknado, but if you if you love tornadoes and you hate sharks and 
you're okay with Sharknado, I don't know. Anyway, this may happen. It may happen that among movies you also have relations. And there, a, lot, a lot more may happen and a lot of them could maybe not be explainable by humans. It could just be that there's an equation among the columns or among the rows that just happens to work. Um, so we're going to live with that. And basically what we're going to do now is we're going to use all this structure of the table among rows and columns to start guessing ratings. Okay, and the way we're going to guess ratings is very simple. We're going to have a table with a lot of holes because, for example, let's say Carlos hasn't uh, interacted with movie four, but from this tremendously predictable uh, table, we know uh, he's going to give it a three, right? Uh, and from a slightly less predictable world, if Carlos hasn't seen movie five, well, from the fact that row one and row three are the same, uh, we, can we can kind of guess that he's going to say whatever Anna said and uh, that he's going to give movie five one star. Okay, so that's how we use this table to predict. So now I'm going to show you some mathematical ways to, to figure out all these dependencies automatically because there's nobody like, you know, it's not like a person watching the tables and being like, oh, look, these two are similar. Like you have to all, do all this like in an algorithm constantly, right? So the answer is matrix factorization and that's what we're going to talk about today. So why factorization? What, what is factorization? Who can help me out? What's an example of factorization you saw in, in childhood maybe? Yes? Huh? Breaking down into smaller components, right? For example, 6 times 4 equals 24, right? 24 is pretty big, but like 6 and 4 are small. But I pressed it in with like smaller things. What we're going to do is express that humongous table into a product of two smaller things. Uh, and uh, that's why it's called matrix factorization. So basically, this times that equals the huge table. So I'm going to show you what this times that are and how we find them. Okay? Um, so we're going to, any questions so far? Feel free to stop me at any moment. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to find this and that. And for that, we need features. Okay? So features are basically, you know, characteristics of a movie. So we can have many, for example, comedy is a feature. It's a movie comedy or not. Uh, action. Uh, we can also have other features like drama, uh, scary, uh, has a big boat, has a sad dog, for example, uh, has Meryl Streep or a sexy Canadian guy called Ryan. This can be random features and, and some of them can be like we have no idea what they are. The computer just managed to put some movies here and some movies there and said, hey, there's a feature. Enough. Um, but we're going to focus on only two and I'm going to show you how to find a product of matrices that gives us the big one based on these two features, okay? Um, so, let's say um, we managed to figure out if Anna likes comedy or action, and also figure out if Mall Cop contains comedy and action. We haven't figured it out yet. So let's say we figure out that Anna likes comedy and doesn't like action, okay? And that Mall Cop happens to have a rating of three for comedy and a rating of one for action. So what do you think is the number of stars that Anna is going to give the movie? Just from, from guessing here, from the, looking at the screen, probably three. I see a lot of people doing three. So yes, three. Because, and this is called the dot product. If you've seen dot product in linear algebra, this is, this is pretty much it. We're going to add the one that she has and not add the one that she doesn't have. So for the sake of redundancy, let's do Betty with comedy and action. So for Malka, it has three and one. So now we give it a how much? One. Good job, everybody. Dana for comedy and action, and she happens to like both. So uh, Sharknado has one for comedy and three for action. So Dana is going to give Sharknado a, do do your fingers, a what? Three. Three? Almost. Because it has comedy and action. Oh, yeah, well, it's not the max, it's the sum. Sorry. <laughs> so it's actually a four. We add the ones that 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 she has. So so Dana gives this a four. Let me put it in more mathematical terms. We basically have uh, two matrices, right? One that tells me if the movies have uh, comedy and action and a rating for those, and the other one that tells me if people like comedy or action. And we're going to use these two matrices to find all the ratings because, for example, Anna uh, for movie one, she has a three and a one, a three and a, for comedy and a one for action. And in the, in the matrix two, she has a yes for comedy and a no for action. So we add the ones that appear with a yes, so we get a three. So from these two matrices, we can reconstruct the entire big matrix. So we can say that the product of these two matrices is the big one, right? Is that clear for everybody? Feel free to stop me 
Um, and so she gives a three. And for the sake of redundancy, let's do Betty for movie one. Uh, movie one is three and one, and Betty has a no and a yes, so it's three. And let's do Dana for movie five. So uh, movie five has a one and a three, one for comedy, three for action. And Dana has a yes and a yes for comedy and action, so it's a four. Okay, so far so good. Uh, and basically, if you're gonna remember one slide, remember this one. Matrix one, which is small, times matrix two, which is small, is equal to matrix three. That's matrix factorization. The, the six times four equals 24, is small matrix times small matrix is equal to the big matrix, okay? Any questions? All right, so I, I like to see it more like this. So like I have my matrix of people and, and, um, and features on the left and uh, features times movies on the right. And then they form this one in the following way. If I wanna find, for example, Betty's rating for movie three, I dot product uh, that column with that row. Okay, and that's basically matrix product. So I get my one times zero plus four times one. Um, and now we can look at other things, right? Do you remember that the first row and the third row were the same? If you look at the first row and the third row on this left matrix, they're both yes and no, right? Because Anna and Carlos both like comedy and hate action. So that's why those two rows are the same. And in the same way, these two columns are the same because Molkop and, uh, and the movie with Seth Rogen have the exact same ratings for comedy and for action. So that makes those two columns the same thing. And you can see actually every, every single relation here because the fact that those two rows add to the third one means that the preferences of Betty plus the preferences of Carlos are the preferences of Dana. Because one likes comedy, the other one likes action, and she and Dana likes both, right? And in the same way, the average of this two is equal to this one because the scores average. So any relations that you find on the two small matrices appear in the big matrix. And that's how we sort of extract these relations into smaller pieces of information, okay? Um, so one, one huge benefit that this has is, is storage, right? Because here we have, uh, as I said, here we have a lot of entries and in the small matrices uh, we, have, we have less entries. Um, how much are we saving there in space though, in terms of space? It's like there's uh, four times five here, so 20. And here there's 10 plus eight, so 18. So we're not saving that much, but you can imagine that in a, in a huge scenario, we can save more, right? Uh, let's say we have a huge matrix with 2,000 users and 1,000 movies. So quick question, how many entries are here? Two million, yes. There's two million entries here. And we managed to factor it into two smaller matrices one of 2,000 users and 100 features, and one of 1,000 movies and 100 features. So now how many entries do we have on the blue ones? Do we have Jeopardy music? Huh? Uh, it's 1,000 times 100, which is 100,000 plus 100 times 2,200. I think it's 300,000, but I have it written. So that one's 200,000, and that one is 100,000. So 300,000 entries. So we, we, we went from 2 million down to 300,000 because we don't need to store everything, right? Like if two rows are the same, we need to store just one and then the information that those two rows are the same. So that's really what we're doing. We're, we're storing the entries and the relations in the, in the blue matrices. Okay, questions? So are you yeah. using any kind of useful information? I mean, we, we lose some stuff because the matrix is not gonna be exactly well uh, defined, but for practical purposes, if we manage to capture something pretty close, then we are then we're we're, we're saving a lot of space and and hopefully not losing that much information. And in reality, that uh, that um, um, red matrix is actually mostly empty. Yes. Because you actually just have a little bit of information. Yeah. The main point is is not to store information, but it's just a benefit. The main point is to guess because the, the red matrix, as you said, is, is mostly empty and we can, if we manage to factor it well, we can fill it up and then guess, guess people's ratings. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, if you wanna find that, that, if you can see that orange square on a red background, that's brilliant to put that, but um, it, that, that comes out of this uh, column and this row, okay? 
Um, I like to see it as matrices. Some people like to see it as uh, graphs. So in the graph, we have the users on top and the movies on the bottom. And every entry on the matrix is, uh, is a label on one of these edges, right? Because every person rates a movie. Uh, and at the end of the day, what we want to do is put two features here, or less number of features, and then associate, instead of people with movies, people with features and features with movies. Okay, so here we have uh, 28 parameters versus 18 parameters. So we didn't save that much, but as we saw already here, 2,000 users, 1,000 movies, we have uh, 2 million uh, ratings here, whereas in here we have 100 features, that means we have 200 uh, numbers on top and 200,000 on top, 100,000 on the bottom, so we end up with 300,000 parameters, okay? So that's really, if you wanna see it, if you like to see it in graphs or if you like to see it in matrices, this is, this is what matrix factorization is. Um, all right, so any, any questions so far? So now I'm gonna tell you what the, the meat of this, which is, okay, this is pretty, but how did you find those matrices, right? Like how did you manage to find the features and each person's ranking with the features and each movie's rating with it? So what we do is train models. So I'm gonna show you a vague idea of, of how Basically, how machine learning models get trained in general. So this is some. It's actually a cartoon of me. Uh, in, in at work, they make cartoon of us and for teaching classes and stuff. So I don't know if that looks like me, but anyway. Um, so basically, what happens is um, I have this matrix in my head, and I want the computer to train to find two matrices that multiply and give me this one. So the computer comes in and says, "Oh, okay, it's this two." And I say, nope, wasn't even close. So the computer goes and finds another one and says, okay, am I doing a little better? And I say, nope, still not. And so it goes back and then comes back and says, how am I doing now? And I guess I say, well, that's close enough. In machine learning, you never say that's awesome, you just say that's close enough. <laughs> and, um, and it just works like, when you get to a certain point. So basically that's, that's the process. And this is called gradient descent, which you'll see in much more detail. Uh, well, in, in a minute and also in, in Janet's part. So gradient descent works like this. Um, basically what you want to do, uh, so when I said, when I had the green check mark and the red uh, cross, what I really meant was ones and zeros. So you're really just multiplying the, the values. I'll show you in a minute. But think of, think of yeses as ones and noes as zeros. And what we want to do is, is find the right matrices, but the computer doesn't know how to find the right matrices, so it starts with random numbers. So it starts with some random numbers, and now notice that I call them F1 and F2 because now I don't know their comedy and, and action. Now I just know there are two features that I have no clue, and some random ratings that I have no clue. And then here, two features and some random ratings, and let's see what happens. So that gives me some matrix, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare this matrix with this matrix. Okay, which is the one I really want to have. So how do we find uh, the entries in the matrix on the left? Can anybody help me out? What, what could the first entry be? And basically we're just gonna compare these two. So any ideas? Uh, say that? 0.36. Uh, maybe not, maybe close. Uh, it's like 1.2 times. Actually, maybe you're right and I made a mistake. Let's see what I got. 0.96. Are you doing 1.2 times 0.2 plus 2.4 times 4.5? So you're doing the right equation. I, I think it's this. 1.2 times 0 0.2 plus 2.4 times 0 0.5. Right? The first entry times the first entry plus the second entry times the second entry. Um, and I got 1.44, uh, but I always get this wrong, so if you, if you got something better, let me know. Um, and we compare the 1.44 with the 3, and then we say, well, that's, that's not even close. As a matter of fact, you need to go up. So we go up by a little bit. So we say, you know what? Uh, increasing this means let's increase these ones a little bit and let's increase these ones a little bit. And let's do it by some tiny value. I don't know, some tiny value. I'll tell you a little bit more about where, where to get this value. But if we increase this, then we do a little better, 192, and let's just say we're okay there and let's move on to the next entry. So we move on to the next entry, which um, I got 1.83. Hopefully you got 1.83 as well. Um, and that compared with the one is uh, small. It's, it's too big, so it needs to go down. 
And so that means let's bring these ones down by a little bit and these ones down by a little bit. And let's keep going. And the computer can do math very quickly. So if it does that for like a long time with all the entries forever and ever and ever, at some point you may get to like something really close. And then you say, okay, that's my matrix factorization. And what are my features? I have no idea. But I got my matrix factorization. Any questions? So that's the process of gradient descent. Um, you may have seen it a different way, so let me actually explain you the traditional way of seeing gradient descent, um, which is with an error function. So what an error function says is basically the following. Before, I was telling the computer, nope, and the computer gets a little confused because it doesn't know if it's doing, if it's close or far or how far. What I really want to do is tell the computer how far it is from an answer, like how far it is from getting the right matrix and maybe trying to get it closer and closer. Um, so I can tell the computer, um, you know, it gives me some matrices, and I said, hey, um, you were wrong by like a number, like 10.3 or something. And so it brings a better case, and I say, okay, you were wrong by 5.32. So it tries to re decrease the error, and then it gets a little better, and I say, okay, you were wrong by 1.23, and maybe that's a number that I'm happy with, right? So let me tell you how to find the number of, to tell you how far you were from the actual matrix. So it goes like this, uh, and again, we're gonna, we're gonna compare this. So in our first iteration, we got 1.44 in the first entry, right, remember? And so we're gonna compare the 1.44 with the three, and uh, basically the, the, the error is just gonna be the distance of this two, and I'm gonna raise it to the square, so that if I'm bigger or smaller, I still get something positive, right? And that's it, I move to the next number, I compare it with this one, and I subtract the square, subtract it, and, and take the square, uh, and I keep going. And I do that for every entry, and I get an error. And that's the error that I get. So at the end of the day, what I tell the computer is, please uh, reduce this error by as much as you can, and the computer knows how to reduce errors, right? How do you minimize, how do you minimize functions in math? The what? Gradient, yes, or the derivative, right? We take the derivative. And so at the end of the day, the derivative of this error split over all these numbers is what's gonna give me the value of what to increase and what to decrease in it at each entry. So when you see gradient descent, you may see it as something like calculate an error, take a derivative, and take steps down. What you're really doing is exactly that, like telling the number, okay, you have to go up a little bit, down a little bit, and continuing that process until one day you find uh, some, some perfect matrix. So a little, actually we're done kind of early, so we'll have time for a break. Um, what, what, what happens at the end is how to use this, right? Uh, at the end of the day, the Netflix matrix looks like this. So it looks like uh, a very sparse matrix with some ratings and a bunch of holes. And what we do is with this information, we can still create an error function and we can still find uh, a set of good matrices that, that will multiply to it, okay? And once we have that, we can fill in the rest of the matrix. So now everybody has a guest rating for the, the, uh, every movie. And then if, for example, uh, Dana logs in, and we say, what are we gonna recommend to her? What do you say? Of, of the two things she hasn't seen, which is movie one and movie three, we just go for movie three, right? Because movie three, we have a predicted uh, rating of five stars, whoops. Uh, we recommend to her movie three, and uh, and that's the end. So, any questions so far before I make? Yes, go ahead. How do people evaluate this? How do people evaluate this? Yeah, With the same error function, actually. Like you end up, you end up. If if you recommend to me three stars, right, and I give it five stars, then I'm adding two to the error function, two squared, right? So this this actually gets trained continuously, and. And now, now the new error function says, okay, well, I, I messed up there, so let's fix my ratings and the ratings of the movie, et cetera, yes. You mean like, uh, yeah. I mean, I know in terms of how often, but it happens that people never rate them, and it happens that people, like, like there's a rating and there's an implicit rating. So if you have a rating, as you saw it already, but if you haven't seen it, then I care about your implicit rating, right? So if you haven't seen it, 
an implicit rating helps me recommend it to you. And if you've seen it and rated, then you're part of the data that I use for the next person, right? So whether you rate it or not, like it, the, you're in some, some part of the system. Is, is that, did I answer your question? Or? If, if there's no information, then that part is not, uh, you cannot uh, fix it. But you, if you watch the whole thing, one assumes that you liked it. If you watched, uh, if, you, if you clicked on it, one assumes that you liked it. So for example, I used to work at YouTube in the recommendations thing. And we have no ratings there because liking or disliking is a really noisy, it really just means that you agree with whatever they say or not. So we never use liking and disliking. We used, um, did you click on it? How much did you watch of it? Uh, and that kind of tells us how, how much you liked it. So there's there's different algorithms that will guess if you're gonna click on something with a probability or how long you watched it. So like this is just a little a little part that guesses the ratings, but at the end of the day there's there's many things one is guessing and there's many ways for you to give information to this without actually rating things. Yeah. Yes. So Exactly. Exactly, you could have many. And it could still give you accurate recommendations. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And many of these features, you just don't know what they are. Like the computer just knows, okay, I have a feature that actually, these are all the ratings for that feature, and we, you cannot figure out what it is. But it just happens to, to work. Uh, so many things, many things are blind. Like many things you just don't know. Um, and, and some of them, are, I mean, I've never worked at Epson, I don't know the details, but some of them I'm imagining are hard-coded, like, like action and comedy, and some of them are just like found by the, by the model. Yeah. Question? So, continuing on what you were saying, um, Netflix actually literally has a category that says, because you watch this, yeah. you might like this. Yeah. So, they're just basically because you finished it, they're like, oh, crap, like, then you might like all this because everybody else finished it. Yeah, like finishing it is a pretty strong signal. If you finished it, you must have liked it, right? Or Absolutely. at least at some point. So that's another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any question over there? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, if you choose like two features, you're probably simplifying things too much. And if you choose two million, you may, may, may not, if you have like five million users and a million, 10 million movies and you pick two million features, it may just be like very similar to your, to your initial metrics. So you want a number that is big, but not that big so that you can actually like find a lot of relations and stuff, you know, exploit the fact that people are, are predictable. So the, 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 the size of how predictable people are is, is the perfect size of, of your smaller matrix. Yeah. Question? In your experience, how big is that number typically for YouTube? Ooh, that's a very good question. Is it 100 or 1,000? No, nah, more. Uh, we didn't do much of that at YouTube because there was no ratings. We used other algorithms like supervised learning. To, um, to, would you have an idea? Um, we use that? something more similar to the last uh, model that I'm going to show you. Um, there is a paper about it. I don't know exactly. I don't think they tell you how many. Um, we used to both work on YouTube, but uh, ah, sure. I don't. Know, <laughs> I don't know if they actually tell you how many features. But there are. It's, it's a lot of features because they 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 have a lot of data. So I'm really getting at my question in a real world modeling scenario. A person can only judge a movie on so many characteristics. I mean, if I watch a movie, matter. I can think of it. Doesn't, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just a uh, more. So the way to think about it is more. It's not a. It's not a real thing. But for example, to, to give you an idea, a similar uh, algorithm is used for words, like basically a representation of a word, and people use 300, 500. Uh, features for a percentage word. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. for example, used in, in natural language processing, you can do this for topic modeling, right? Like you have a lot of articles and a lot of words that appear on them, and then you split into topics. So imagine like if you have, I don't know, a thousand articles, how many topics do you think where there would be? Maybe like 20? 
that's kind of like a ballpark of the size of the major state. Yes. Yeah, I guess you would just, it's like a hyperparameter, right? So you would just, uh, I, what I would do is pick, pick a bunch of different values for the features and see which one does the best in your training and, and in your testing. And uh, that's the perfect value. Also, you want to do it fast, right? You can add horsepower, which is yep. the analytical solution takes forever. Yeah, you, wanna, you want the recommendations to appear immediately in like 10 seconds, right? So there's many things to, to keep into account. Yeah. There are more questions around here? Uh, maybe you and then you? Okay. Yeah. So, so that, is it fair to say that choosing the correct number of features is, there's no exact science exactly. to it? No. It's like, I guess, domain expertise, intuition, and just a lot of experimentation. Yes, like everything in machine learning, all those three things. There's no real number. Like a lot of a lot of experimentation. Most of the decisions one makes in in a place like that is basically saying I tried this and that and that and that and that, and then this one just ended up with more people watching things. So let's go for that one. Yeah. If I have a what? Text. Text. Tax. Tax. Sorry, uh, if you have, to, absolutely, absolutely. Like if you have, for example, hard-coded features, which I know they have because, for example, you look at Netflix and it's like recommending comedy movies, recommending this. So like if, yeah, tags tags definitely help and they help at YouTube as well because when you upload a video, you can put a bunch of tags. Um, so yeah, those those help a lot. But basically, some some are the ones you know and some are just blind from the, from the model. How do I use those tags? Yes. So based on the algorithm, algorithm you kind of described here, um, when you're training, like, you either like increment all the feature weights at once, or decrement them. Once. Many things can happen, right? You, you can use both. You can use take the derivative and, and use do all the um, all the entries at the same time, or, or one at a time, um, or some at a time, like in batch. I don't know which one you use in your lab, or or do you use a right particular? Right now, mostly it's batch. But Mostly like batch. Like, I'm gonna use uh, all of them. Like, yeah, so I, I did one at a time, but you can do like five at a time or something. Is it ever the case that you would like raise one feature weight and decrease another? Of course, because if you think about it, if you take the derivative, right, it's a sum of like I don't know, 20 things, okay. and some of them will be positive, some of them will be negative, and at the end of the day, you're you're adding and subtracting a bunch, so it, it ends up some value. So it will, it will happen that you raise things and lower things, okay. but we just live with that. Yeah. There's a question there. Yeah, I guess some. Um, they probably have what, what they have. You do is like a like a like an opening page for everybody. Like you, you start with like a clean page, and then based on your interactions of things, you start collecting data pretty quickly. Um, a lot of interactions, right? Did you see this? Uh, like, like it look it looks like interactions are slow because you click on something, you watch something, but at the end of the day, it's like if like a video appears and you didn't click on it, that's an interaction. So so. Data fills up pretty quickly when you start. So you start with that generic thing and 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 start and you, your data starts filling up, and then you have a better and better idea. The more you interact with Netflix or YouTube, the more you're they're gonna know of you. But if you haven't interacted much, they start they start knowing some things. More questions? Question at the back. Yeah, yeah. There are many methods to to tune in hyperparameters, and a lot of them are a lot of them are automatic, right? Like they're, they're built into whatever uh, package you're using. Any more questions? Well, uh, yes. What would be the best approach to validate this model? Uh, I'm gonna lie and then check with Jeanette. Um, I think uh, what I would do is just pick it. 
the general pick, pick a testing set and pick some hyperparameters for for the size of the features, and then just uh, just look at how I'm doing with the training set and and with the testing set, and um, and just go from there like in any normal algorithm. Is that what you do in your lab? Sort of. Yeah, yeah. So you, you take uh, a part of the matrix at random uh, that actually, in reality, you should do it by time, right? That you train on your history and the future. Here we are going to do like that, just take a random set of it and try to predict that. Which is the way it's done much better. Yeah, pretty much. It's the same. Yeah, pretty much the same the way. Any more questions? So let me uh, do some. Advertising. This this talk actually I will record it in a you know YouTube video. Well, it'll, it'll appear in this one, but I'll also record it. I have a YouTube channel where I put a bunch of machine learning talks in, in cartoonish mode. Uh, there's uh, machine learning neural networks, uh, etc. Many things. So take a look. Uh, and uh, if you really like this, I also I also teach courses online. So at Udacity, I teach uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence. So check out the platform. This is me teaching different classes. Um, I always wear the same shirt, but I try to have a different facial hair at uh, every picture to to keep uh, keep it interesting. And uh, finally, yeah, you should take a look if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, go to the app, Udacity app, and there's actually some free courses in the very top. Uh, there's machine learning, deep learning, and others. So please take a look. And I think that's it. These are my coordinates. And thank you for your attention.